produced by Sun, and uh, I was very proud that there were more critical bugs in other areas than in ZFS uh, in, in that first uh, appliance. And also, um, ZFS was released in the uh, first uh, production release for FreeBSD 7.0. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, one of the problems with the original ZFS uh, Fuse port on Linux was not so much to speak to ZFS or to Linux, but um, it couldn't really be used that well in production because of the performance implications of Fuse. But um, having the port to FreeBSD, and then uh, today we have people working on the port to native Linux. Um, release candidate is out n uh, now. So um, there's been a whole lot of support in the community, a whole lot of really great um, production quality ports. Um, but in 2010, you know, Oracle uh, purchased Sun, and they stopped contributing to uh, the source code for OpenZFS. So there are a lot of questions about um, what that meant for the community, what that meant for ZFS. Um, you know, most of the contributions to ZFS, in fact, the vast majority up till that time, uh, were from Sun. Uh, so you know, what was going to happen? Was it just going to stagnate? Well, you know, as we've seen, of course, it didn't. The, the community really picked up ZFS and used it and, one of the, and, and contributed back to it and improved it. So uh, today we're going to be talking about some of the reasons why that happened and you know, look at some examples of how that has happened. Um, so there's a lot of features that are unique to OpenZFS. Um, these features are, for the most part, available in all the uh, major platforms of OpenZFS. So Lumos, FreeBSD, Linux, macOS, um, but not in uh, Oracle Solaris today. So these features kind of run the gamut of uh, different areas of ZFS, and I'm just going to quickly highlight some of them. So at Delphix, uh, one of the main value adds of our product is that it reduces the amount of space um, needed for all your copies of copies of your production database uh, by using ZFS snapshots and clones. So um, because space is so important to our product, um, we realized there were a few gaps in um, how that space is reported. So in, to enable better, uh, more clear reporting of what space is being used, why, uh, why and where, um, we made a bunch of enhancements. Uh, and we also uh, have worked on, with collaboration with uh, Bill from Join, a bunch of fixes to ZFS Send, which I'll be talking about later today. So um, this is all great, but uh, you know, ZFS, Open ZFS is not some piece of open source software from out of somebody's garage, right? This comes from you know a really rigorous engineering practice at Sun, and you know that's something that we've really embraced in the community. And part of that is ensure to ensure that we have a production ready, rock solid uh, piece of storage architecture. Um, we need to make sure that we're uh, debugging and testing that. So part, a big part of that is automated testing. So big thanks to uh, John Kennedy uh, of Delphix for taking the ZFS test suite and uh, returning it to working order. So we've fixed a lot of the uh, problems that were in the test suite, a lot of bugs where tests were failing because the, not because ZFS was broken, but because the test suite was relying on um, too particular behavior of ZFS. So we fixed a lot of those tests, we've added a lot of new tests for uh, a lot of the new features that I mentioned here. Um, and uh, we're working on developing a new, simpler test framework than the uh, old STS-based uh, framework there. So, unfortunately, as you all know, all the features in the world won't cut it um, if you don't have good performance. So, uh, there's also been a lot of work in performance areas. So one of the big things is, um, so as I mentioned in our product at Delphix, we use a lot of ZFS snapshots and clones. Well, uh, there's a problem with the ARC, which is the um, caching layer in ZFS, uh, where if you have multiple snapshots or clones um, accessing the same data, well, that data might be shared on disk, which is great, right? That's the storage savings that, uh, that we're selling to our customers. But um, in Oracle Solaris, the, there would be multiple copies of that data in memory, cached in memory. So um, we've, we've improved that. Um, so that now, in memory, we're only caching one copy of each of those blocks. So you know the 10x storage savings that you can get by using ZFS snapshots and clones, now you can get that 10x savings in memory as well. Um, another thing that, we, that uh, we've worked on is uh, background destroy file systems. So before, you type ZFS destroy, or you know, your application would run, would destroy a file system, and it would just sit there 
until every all the space had been reclaimed. So if you're at the command line, you know you can kind of well, okay, I agree. I can background it and then not kind of not worry about it. But um, when building an appliance on top of uh, ZFS, you don't want your um, GUI to be sitting there hanging while you're just re recovering all the space because it might take you know minutes or hours. Who knows how long? Uh, so. Um, Chris Seiden, uh, another one of my colleagues, implemented background destroy a file system. So we, we can destroy the file system immediately. It goes away. Um, it's totally gone from the namespace. You can, you know, with all the implications of that. But then in the background, we reclaim the space. And in the process, we also found a more than 100x speed up in um, destroying of clones. Um, the, uh, the Spectral Logic guys, who we'll be speaking later today, have done some great performance improvements uh, for partial block writes. So this is when your uh, application is writing um, part of a block or a misaligned block that isn't aligned with the block size of ZFS, um, you would have to actually read the data off disk when you're trying to write it, and they've eliminated that the need for that read. So one of our goals from day one with ZFS was to end the suffering of system administrators um, who had long suffered with uh, you know, storage products that were very difficult to use, like UFS and uh, SVM, Slurs Volume Manager. Um, and that mission continues today with a bunch of performance and a bunch of uh, enhancements to command line utilities to make it easier to, to use for system administrators. But all that um, com command line enhancements don't really help the, uh, prog the programmatic users, so all these products that have been built on top of ZFS. There's tons of people that are using ZFS that don't even know about it because they're using a product which uses ZFS internally, um, like Delphix, uh, like an Accenta store, um, and others that we'll hear about today. So uh, one of the biggest changes in this area is the introduction of libzfs core. So this is a new library API designed with precise semantics for programmatic use. Um, so it doesn't automatically do everything in the world for you, um, but it allows you to precisely control what the system is doing uh, on your behalf. It's thread safe, uh, has programmatic error handling, and precisely defined atomicity. So, um, there have been a bunch of other features. I think on this slide we have seven features from seven different contributors, which is awesome. Um, one I'd like to highlight is that you know, ZFS has always quote unquote supported um, devices with 4K sectors. So we're talking about um, advanced format drives, these new drives coming out today with like three terabytes and more capacity. Um, but that support has been far from production quality. Um, it hasn't really received the test, the testing uh, and qualification needed to, to really be used in production. So later today, um, George is gonna talk about the changes needed uh, the changes made to ZFS to make it more usable with uh, these 4K sector devices. So I've highlighted some of the unique features in OpenZFS, uh, but really that's just the tip of the iceberg. So in the past 24 months, uh, ZFS has had over, well, over 100 people have contributed to OpenZFS on the three major platforms. Um, and those 100 people come from more than 50 organizations. And uh, on Linux, which is uh, the youngest of these three ports, it's seen over 700 commits just in the past 24 months. So a really rapid rate of development there. And the, so the diversity of those platforms has enabled a bunch of companies to build products based on ZFS, on Lumos, on FreeBSD, uh, and on Linux. So today we're gonna hear more from some of these companies about why they're using ZFS and how it, makes, it helps make their company successful. So uh, today, as I mentioned, we'll hear from some of these companies. Uh, we're also going to talk about um, tools and techniques for observing ZFS and tuning its performance. Um, and uh, right after lunch, we're going to have a panel discussion about the platform diversity of ZFS, uh, what it means for it to be available on um, all these platforms and more, uh, and uh, why you might choose one platform over another, what kinds of features are available, what kinds of uh, integrations specific to those platforms. And of course, we're going to talk about what the future might hold for ZFS. So I wanted to um, share just one example of one small area uh, of ZFS and how it's evolved over time. 
So back in 2005, uh, we were getting ready to ship ZFS. We were just finishing up the code. Um, and I was working in Beijing, China for a few months, uh, helping Sun set up a new, uh, new, new office there. So unfortunately, one of our development tools was this uh, really ancient source code management system um, that was essentially had the performance of rsync over NFS. Um, so even at its best, um, this, this tool was, had pretty lackluster performance. Uh, but then combined with the, a low bandwidth high latency link between Beijing and Menlo Park, the, the performance is really atrocious. It, I spent, you know, I think half my time twiddling my thumbs or trying to find something else to do while I was waiting for it to just uh, bring over the changes from, um, from Menlo Park of all, what everybody had made in the entire organization. And I was thinking, like, this is a really simple task. All that you need to do is, like, find the modified files, ship them over here, why do we even need to care about the latency of you know talking back and forth and asking you know the problem is that we're asking the system hey Menlo Park have you changed this file no nope. okay let me ask about the next file have you changed that one no nope. and every time you know waiting you know hundreds of milliseconds over this uh, low latency link or high latency link um, so from that I kind of got the idea of like couldn't we do this better in ZFS so in ZFS uh, I invented ZFS send and receive so this is the ability to send the changes from one file system across the wire to another uh, to another storage pool, and um, the solution is latency insensitive. So we know what the other we implicitly know what the other side has because we know it has this snapshot. And we're just going to send it all the changes necessary to get it up to date with this newer snapshot. So it's unidirectional, meaning it's latency insensitive. It doesn't matter what the latency of the network link is, and it's able to quickly find and send only the changed blocks uh, or files. So this is great. It solved my problem uh, in China, and you know we sh we got the test done uh, on time and, and shipped the source code out. Um, and today, you know that's enabled uh, a bunch of products to build remote replication um, features on top of ZFS send and, re send and receive, um, including Delphix and including the Z the Sun Oracle uh, ZFS storage clients. But one problem has plagued um, ZFS send from the beginning. So as I mentioned, the big benefit of this is being able to do the incremental changes and, and very quickly find them and send them. Um, but there's no way to tell how big that set of changes would be up front. So you know, you'd be doing this incremental replication and just kind of crossing your fingers and hoping that it would complete before morning came and all of your employees came and started using their, their storage server. So. Um, you know, we had this problem at Delphix as well. Uh, so I was able to figure out how to quickly and accurately come up with an estimate of how much, uh, how much space we would need to send. Um, so without, without having to go and, you know, kind of uh, a priori uh, look at compute exactly all the data that would need to be sent by traversing all the metadata, we were, um, instead we were able to use some data that was already on disk, uh, massage that a little bit to figure out how big the send stream would be. So that's great. So now we know, okay, this is how much, how big the, the send stream is going to be. Well, uh, that's great, so we know it's going to be, say, two gigabytes. We start sending it. Um, we're, an hour has passed, uh, so how much time is left? Well, we don't really know, because we don't know how far we've gone. So um, Bill Pajewski took up this and uh, extended it forward, adding a, a feature to be able to report the send progress. So how much uh, have we actually completed so far? Um, and. Uh, then uh, applications and, and would be able to programmatically query that and then uh, do some math and compute how much time we think will be left. Will be left. But today, well yesterday, um, I implemented uh, some extra fanciness for the CLI users, which hopefully I have a little demo here of that you'll be able to see. All right, so here we're gonna do a ZFS send, um, incremental send, which is the dash i flag from this snapshot, whose name is 1G, um, to this new snapshot, uh, whose name is D. Um, and the dash, the dash V flag uh, is the one that I enhanced to display the uh, amount of, is a verbose flag, it tells you how much space is gonna be used. Um, so we run this, we see, okay, great. The total estimated size is 2.7 gigabytes. Um, but now we get this um, update every one second telling us how much has completed? So 300 megabytes has completed. Good, so good. Um, how, how fast it's going, 20 megabytes per second, and then the estimated time remaining, 
Uh, here we've got about a minute and a half. Um, things are not cached as well as when I had set up this demo. <laughs> so, um, awesome systems demo, right guys? <laughs> At least it only took one minute. So, So that's just um, one example, and we're going to hear many more uh, things like that about how um, we've enhanced CFS, made it much better for um, people to base their businesses on and, and create products based on top of it. So there's a lot of great ideas about how to move CFS forward and what we should be doing in the future. Um, and uh, the, one of the great things about CFS is that compared to a lot of other um, storage systems, um, it's a relatively modern uh, architecture. So this enables uh, a lot of easy development of new features, um, new you know, plug-in architecture, like enabling new compression algorithms, um, new observability enhancements. And my hope is that um, you guys will all uh, learn about ZFS today, about how it can be used, uh, why you would use it, and um, that you will take ZFS and go make something awesome out of it, and then share your ideas with the community.